Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. At the outset, I want to express my gratitude for you as a church. You are a body that continually leans in Sunday by Sunday to the preached Word of God. I've seen that from day one. It's been a characteristic of our church. Uh, you not only make it a priority to be here when you could be sleeping in or, I guess, this week catching the NFL pregame, but you come eager to hear and by faith apply God's Word to your lives. You hold these moments as truly a supernatural moment, and it's a joy to see. And I want to commend you for that. That's not something that we ever want to take for granted. We never want to get used to it. It's hard to believe, but there are still many places on the planet today where access to Scripture is either limited or non-existent. And we also want to recognize that the Bible repeatedly affirms that being able to hear and respond to God's Word is itself a free gift of grace. This is not automatic. It is God being faithful to us. So thank you for being a word-loving and a word-obeying church. Now with conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, with reverence for our Savior, let us approach these words together. Once again, ready to be addressed by our great shepherd this morning. This is God's word. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. I entreat Yodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Lord, speak to us today for your glory, for our good. On April 26, 2008, Western Oregon's softball team took on the mighty Central Washington Wildcats. It was a crucial game for each team's season, and in the midst of the intense contest, Western Oregon player Sarah Tukolsky stepped up to the plate. Her team was down one run, and there were two runners in scoring position. Despite her being a senior, she had never hit a home run her entire college career. That was until one crack of her bat sent the ball soaring over the center field wall. And in jubilation, she began to round the bases. The only problem was that she actually missed the first base. So she had to hastily turn around to go back to tag it. And when she did that, her ACL gave out. She immediately collapsed to the dirt. Unable to get up, she had to literally crawl back to first base. Now, according to the rules, none of her teammates in this situation are allowed to touch her while play is in progress or she would have been automatically ruled out. And if the Western Oregon manager, her manager, had called timeout and put in a pinch runner, that runner would have had to start on first base because that's as far as she had ever advanced. So she would have had to forfeit her home run. So everybody kind of sat and stunned and sat in silence. What do we do? And in an unreal display of sportsmanship, one of Central Washington's captains stepped forward in that moment and asked if there was any rule against a player being helped by the opposing team. When the umpire replied that there wasn't, she and one other player from Central Washington rushed over, and they carefully helped Tukolsky to her feet. And with their arms around their shoulders, they carried her around the bases, allowing her to touch each base gently on the way home until she crossed home plate. Her three-run homer went into the books, and because it did, Central Washington lost the game 4-2. to two. And not only did they lose the game, they also lost out on a chance at a conference title and a playoff berth. After the game, reporters asked the young lady who had stepped in to help, why did you do it? Why would you do that? Why would you knowingly make a choice to sabotage your, sabotage your entire season for the sake of someone who's on the opposing side? And this was her response. In the end, it is not about winning and losing so much. It was about this girl. She hit it over the fence and was in pain, and she deserved a home run. Clearly, this game was very important to the players that took the field that day. They had worked and sacrificed for countless hours to have the chance, to finally have the chance at a title. But, but it was also obvious by their response in that moment 
that as much as that meant to them, as much as they wanted to win, there was something that meant even more to them. There was something that was even greater, something that they were even willing to lose for. Well, as we just read, Paul has turned to exhort two different teams in the church in Philippi. There are factions that have begun to happen. They're, they're led by two prominent women. The church is, to some degree, embroiled in a conflict, and neither side in this situation, in this contest, is willing to budge. And so the situation has developed so much that it's now a public matter, and it seems to be affecting the entire church. And it's so much so that in a letter that's overflowing with exhortation and encouragement, Paul is compelled to address this particular issue before he closes the letter. And he does so by urgently appealing to each side. He appeals for them to look to their common life, to see their common love, and for those things, the greater things, to help them overcome any temporary divisions. That's what he's appealing for here. Indeed, he believes, he truly believes, that the love of Christ is powerful enough to heal fractured relationships. The love of Christ is is powerful enough to heal fractured relationships. And so he calls for tough actions. He calls for tough steps of obedience in light of that trust. And frankly, this is an appeal that we all need to hear today. Because conflict, when that moment comes, conflict reveals what we love most. Conflict reveals what we love most. That's what this text is showing us. It is pointing that out in our lives. So we're going to unpack this in two parts this morning. First, we'll see that conflict tests our love for the Savior. Conflict tests our love for the Savior. That's in verse 2. And second, we're going to see that conflict tests our love for one another. That's in verse 3. Conflict is going to test our love for one another. So that first aspect, conflict tests our love for the Savior. We don't know a whole lot about these two ladies. There's not much. Actually, there's nothing that's captured in Scripture that tells us who they are apart from this brief snapshot. Nothing else is recorded about them. But it's evident from these verses that they are pillars in this local church. And it's most likely that these are mature believers. But now some type of division has arisen between them personally. And not only that, it's gone on long enough that it's starting to affect the entire church. It's enough of a problem that Paul takes rather drastic measures to address this situation. Look in verse 2. He says, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Remember, the whole church, in these words, the whole church would have gathered to hear this letter read out loud. And so calling them out by name would have been a massive deal. It's essentially a very compassionate and yet a still very real and public rebuke. He's calling them out in the assembly itself. That's a tactic that Paul rarely used especially for those who are in the church. But apparently he knew them well enough to know that they could handle this kind of blunt reprimand. So what exactly is it that they were disagreeing over? Nobody nobody today actually knows for sure because the text doesn't say. But we can make several important and necessary observations about this disagreement, things that we we can know. This is not some sort of vital theological disagreement between them. Listen, Paul is never going to call for unity with somebody who is teaching heresy or distorting the gospel message. He's never going to call for that. In fact, he's already, we've seen that. He's already called out false teachers just one chapter earlier. We walked through that several weeks back. Nor does this disagreement appear to have started over one of them walking in sin and worldliness. Just as he had previously called out the false teachers, he's now, he's also, he's also along the way called out those whose pattern of life is contrary to the example that he left. So that's not the situation, as far as we can tell, for these two ladies. So whatever this conflict is about, it's not a black and white scriptural issue because Paul doesn't weigh in on it, one side or the other. That's important to notice. This isn't Paul appealing for a unity that's outside of Christ. That's what the world calls for. This is not one of those verses that you can pull out to support those coexist bumper stickers that you see around town. That's not, what he's, that's not what he's calling for here. Perhaps this disagreement is over differing convictions. That's possible. Perhaps it's something that's more personal between them. 
Perhaps now it's a mix of both. Maybe it started one and turned into the other. But whatever conflict they are waging, it isn't a conflict that's worth continuing. This is not a hill to die on, either for them or for the church. But the problem is neither side seems willing to budge on it. So where do you go in that moment? How do you move past... <laughs> When you've dug in a trench, and you're in that trench, how do you move past the feeling that you just have to win this one? When giving an inch feels like giving a mile. When losing doesn't feel like an option at all. It's off the table. How do you recover from something that in the past may have felt like a gut punch? How do you peel yourself off the turf and then turn around and help up your opponent? Well, look at what Paul appeals to here. He doesn't make light of their feelings. He doesn't tell them to just get over it. He doesn't even say that the matter isn't important. That's not how he handles it. No, he points them to something much greater. He points them to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Do you see that there at the end of verse 2? He says, agree. He asks them to agree where? In the Lord. That's where he's pointing them. It's easy to miss that, but this is not a throwaway phrase. That last phrase of the sentence is not a throwaway phrase. In fact, it's the truth. It's the truth of the entire thing. It holds everything else up. This is where, this is where he's pointing them in that moment. When you hit that moment, this is where he points them. He lifts their gaze to see again the Savior who gave up all of his rights for their sake to the one who was willing to lose so that they could win. He is the one. He is the one who stands over and above whatever it is that they are facing. No matter how divisive the issue is or how deep their feelings run, ultimately, ultimately their loyalty is to him and to his cause. And in that, they are together in the Lord. Maybe they will never agree on this particular issue, but because they love Jesus, because they love him, they can have affection for one another. And they can find common ground in him. So how do we overcome this type of conflict? When we're in that moment, how do we begin to move in, in, in the direction of what, a person that we consider our opponent? Especially in the church. How do we do that? We do that by loving someone greater. We love that. That's, that's our motivation. That's the only thing that's ever going to help you. It, 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 ultimately, this is where our loyalty has to be. And if we aren't willing, if we aren't willing to give on less, lesser matters, possibly even on things that mean a lot to us personally, for the, sake of, for the sake of Christ, when that moment comes, and we know it's for his sake that we need to give on this one, if we aren't willing to do that, that's an indicator of where our heart truly lies. It points that out to us. Because no matter what we say with our mouths, or how loud we sing on Sundays, or how many theologians we can quote, conflict is the place where rubber will meet the road. It will expose where our true affections lie. And if we can't get to a place where we are willing to agree in Christ, there's a problem there. If we genuinely love Jesus, we will love the things that he loves. We will love the things that bring him glory and honor over and above the things that bring us temporary satisfaction or safety. And what does he love? We sang about this morning. What does he love? He loves his bride. And so must we. Our loyalty to him, our love for his church must decide. Those things must decide which battles we will win at all costs because there are some that are worth that and which ones we will lay aside. We can't win personal battles and spiritual ones at the same time. We can't protect self and promote Christ. In conflict, we have to decide which one of these is ultimately more important to us. Our point or his safety or his glory? Which one is ultimately more important to us? The point that we're trying to make, the victory that we need to have, or his glory? To our watching world, 
Jesus Christ is already considered, he's already written off as irrelevant to the biggest struggles of our day. And a divided church, a divided church is never going to convince them otherwise. It will only push them away. By claiming the name of Christ, you and I, we together are on a stage and not just as isolated actors. Personal integrity should absolutely matter because it reflects on Christ when people know we're Christians. But just as much, corporate integrity must matter as well because that reflects on him even more so. So like these two women, even if we are willing to boldly stand in the face of cultural opposition and declare that Christ is Lord, are we just as willing to lose personal battles for his sake? It's a hard question, isn't it? It's a hard question. For some of us, it may be the hardest thing that we're ever asked to do. But along our journey, those kinds of sacrifices, those moments will absolutely be necessary if the unity of the church is going to be preserved. And at times, laying down arms may be the most crucial thing we do to further the gospel. Do we love Christ enough, enough to be willing to lose for him if need be? We have to take a long, hard look at our hearts and ask ourselves that question honestly. If I were in the shoes, if I were in the shoes of one of these women, if I was dug in here, convinced I was right, would I be willing to agree in the Lord? But I love him enough to not win this fight. Listen, these are real people. Can't put, put them on a stained glass window and, and place a halo over their head. The appeal for them would have been just as difficult as it would be for us today. It would have tested them as well. Words that had been spoken couldn't be unspoken. Actions, whatever they were, couldn't be uh, rewound. Wounds had been inflicted. And yet here, Paul is. He's pointing them to the wounds of Christ. And he says, here. Here you will find agreement. Here in the loving arms of the Lord, you are secure enough to lose. Find all that you need in him so that you can find peace with one another. Conflict. Conflict tests our love for Christ. And to the degree that it drives us deeper into our relationship with him. Needing more of his grace and more of his goodness. And needing his help and dependence. To the degree that it does that, it is for our good even while it is painful. But as much as conflict tests our love for Christ, it also is going to test our love for each other. Look at verse 3. Paul says, yes, I ask you also, somebody else here in this story. Yes, I ask you also, true companion. Help these women who have labored with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul turns here to address another leader that's in the church, and he strongly appeals for his help in this matter. Commentators are divided as exactly who this true companion is. There's a lot of different theories out there about who this person is. I personally think he may be talking about Luke. Uh, Luke has a long history with this church, and it would make sense. But... But suffice it to say, this person is well known enough that everybody in the church, when he references, he uses that title, everybody in the church knows exactly who he's talking about. This person is well known enough. And clearly, Paul is holding him in very high regard here. He doesn't seem, this person doesn't seem to be entangled himself personally in this conflict, but he does seem to have enough credibility and stature to be able to help mediate it. And Paul thinks the time has come to commission his involvement. And so Paul turns to his trusted partner. And he says, I need you, I need you to take the loving risk of getting involved. They need help, and you are the one to help them. And let's be be clear here, because help them can, can, can sound like a lot of different things. There's a wide spectrum of what help them could sound like to our ears today. There's there's the idea of, man, could could you just help? And then there's help. There's help. That that's more of what, what this is here. He's not saying, Paul's not saying here. 
If it's convenient, please just kind of give them a little extra boost and then check in every so often to make sure things are running smoothly. No, this is, this is an urgent. It would have conveyed an idea of an urgent help, urgent involvement. It's a roll up your sleeves and dive in kind of help. It's a costly rushing in. It's one that doesn't allow your clothes to stay clean. Sadly, this kind of help is one that we understand, we're familiar with. Even over this past week, we've watched heartbreaking images roll in from Hurricane Dorian and the destruction that it brought. We've seen relief agencies ready and willing as soon as possible to immediately jump in and render needed aid. That's the idea of help here. Seeing the need and jumping in full bore. Doing whatever is necessary and overcoming any obstacles to help those who are in need. And that's certainly the kind of help, that, that image, that, that's the kind of help that Paul is asking for here. You see, dispensing advice isn't the same thing as helping, although counsel may be necessary along the way. Saying what people should do and then assuming that they should just get it is not actually helping them. There's a difference between being the manager who calls for a cleanup on aisle three and being the clerk who actually comes in to wipe it up. Make no mistake. You do not help out a conflict by engaging in an air raid. Too much is at stake and emotions are too high. If you drop truth bombs from 10,000 feet, you might actually make it worse for those involved. This is a special forces, boots on the ground kind of operation. And walking into a battlefield that way is never a safe endeavor. Even a medic can get shot. But those, those are exactly the situations that we as Christians are called to respond to. And if we don't put ourselves in harm's way to help when the stakes are high, then who's going to? And remember, Paul isn't asking his companion. He's not asking us to do something that he himself is not willing to do. He's not already done himself. He's already taken quite a risk to bring this up publicly. He's enjoyed a long and fruitful relationship with these ladies. They'd helped him along his way and his mission. And now he risks turning both of them away, possibly. Both of them against him by his appeal. But he can't hear about it and then stand idly by, allowing it to go on unaddressed. He's just not willing to do that. And in our day, when those kind of moments come to us, we hear about it. We can come up with a lot of plausible reasons to not get involved, can't we? Calendar's just too full. I don't have time to take on another project. I have enough issues of my own. Why should I get involved in anybody else's? Their business is their business, and my business is my business. But those who claim to love the gospel and the church, for those of us who do, don't we have the privilege, and yes, even the responsibility to help? Don't our days belong to Christ? Aren't we called to be peacemakers? Are we allowed to have the luxury of sitting this one out and saying, this, one, this one's not my fight? Even if it affects the well-being of our brothers and sisters, or it hinders the mission that we share? Now, the gospel calls us out. The gospel calls us out. It calls us beyond our excuses. It calls us beyond our fears. It tells us to bear one another's burdens because, praise God, we have one who has borne our ultimate burden. And he is the one who makes our shoulders wide enough, wide enough in these moments to bear these lesser ones. We cannot do it on our own, but he is there with us. It compels us towards unity in Christ because that is what he prayed for in the garden on the night before he died in our place. Listen, the gospel. The gospel reorients It reorients our priorities in a conflict from how can I stay safe to how can I help. It changes. John Stott, in his excellent book, The Cross of Christ, he describes the change that the gospel brings to our lives like this. Insistence on security is incompatible with the way of the cross. What daring adventures the Incarnation and the Atonement were. 
What a breach of convention and decorum that Almighty God should renounce His privileges in order to take human flesh and bear human sin. Jesus had no security except in His Father. So to follow Jesus is always to accept at least a measure of uncertainty, danger, and rejection for His sake. That's what it's going to take for this trusted partner to help them. That's what it's going to take. Conflict tests our love for one another. You see, it was while we were in the midst of our rebellion against God that the heart of our Savior was revealed towards us. He is the one who took a risk beyond anything that we can imagine. He is the one who stepped into our messiness. He is the one that came to us when we were in the middle of our battle, and he rescued us. He purchased our peace with his own life. That heart, that heart, that love is what moves us. It moves us out of the costly peace that we have received. Peace with God himself as a free gift by grace. It's by that that we are able to serve the cause of peace in his kingdom. You see, conflict is inevitable in the church. It's going to happen. We don't want to flatter ourselves here. We aren't smarter or morally superior. We haven't moved past the church in Philippi. If this church, which was planted by the Apostle Paul himself, wasn't immune to conflict, then we certainly will not be either. And if mature believers like Yodi and Syntyche, people who have suffered for the sake of the gospel, who have faced persecution for the sake of the gospel, weren't above conflict, then none of us here today is above it either. Certainly we hope, that, we hope that's not the case. We always want to be keeping a short record of wrongdoing with one another and pursuing peace personally as much as we can. But these verses also paint for us a very realistic picture. Conflict is inevitable in the church. And when it comes, it is always going to be a refining moment for us. It's going to be like a giant spotlight shining on our souls. And what it's doing is it's showing, it's helping us see what we truly love. Prosperity and ease allow those things to stay hidden in darkness. But conflict, conflict forces a choice upon us. We must choose. What do we really love? Do we love Christ or do we love winning Do we love the church, or do we love staying safe? Those are the questions that we have to answer in these moments. So as we close today, I want us to honestly assess those questions in our heart. Maybe, maybe there's somebody here this morning that right now is dealing with this exact issue. You're in the midst of an ongoing conflict yourself. Perhaps it's a big issue. Perhaps it's a relatively small one, but for whatever reason, it feels big. Maybe it's recent. Maybe it's something that you've been carrying with you for decades. Maybe it's with a person who's on the other side of the country. Maybe it's with somebody who's on the other side of your house. Perhaps you saw it coming a mile away. Perhaps it blindsided you. Whoever that person is, whatever that situation is, are you, are you willing to respond to Paul's appeal this morning? If I were to ask you to put your name right here in verse 2, I entreat your name here. Would your heart start beating a little faster? Does even taking one small step of faith towards agreement in the Lord feel just overwhelming to you? Would you immediately want to run away as fast as you can instead of facing this particular conflict? If that's you, if that describes you, 
be encouraged. If you, if you say, yes, when you describe that, when you describe that that's me. I, I'm feeling that right now. That's me. That's exactly how I feel. I, I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today because I believe the Lord is wanting to meet you right there. He wants to meet you right there. And he's wanting to meet you in a powerful way. Listen, agreeing in the Lord, agreeing in the Lord doesn't require you to just become best friends and just move on and never and pretend like nothing ever happened. That's, that's not what this is saying. It, it may not ever be that you come, come to a complete agreement on the, whatever issue it is that's dividing you. You may never be able to get to that point. But, but it does mean you lay down your arms for the sake of Jesus Christ. He is worthy of that. Can you respond to this appeal? He's here. He is the one who is the great peacemaker. He is the one whose spirit is with you. Can you respond in faith today and take that first step? Or maybe you aren't involved in a conflict yourself right now, but you know one, you know of one that's going on and it needs your help. Maybe you've done your best to ignore that sense of conviction in your heart. Maybe you've done your best to even distance yourself from it. Maybe you've cut off people who in times past you stood side by side with. Maybe you've just cut them off entirely. Maybe in a previous small group or a church or wherever. Maybe you've tried to run away from the situation entirely. But deep down there's this gnawing feeling that you know you have a role to play in seeing this one resolved. Not everyone, but in this one. Standing on the sidelines here isn't an option for you. Is the Lord asking you this morning to jump in and render aid? Is he, is he asking you that? Is he calling you to take the, the risky plunge of helping? Remember what Stott said, insistence on security is incompatible with the way of the cross. Would you be bold enough to make that first call? Or to send that first text? Would you be willing to make room on your calendar specifically for the sake of investing it right here? Would you be willing for Christ's agenda to be your agenda? No, it isn't easy. It isn't easy. We don't want to pretend like it is. Paul is not, not saying it is here. This isn't, him, this isn't him just throwing it out there and moving on. He knows it's weighty. He knows it's weighty. It isn't easy to get involved. But if you aren't there in those moments of need, who will be? Who will be? Unless you're still wrestling with it. Whatever it is the Lord may be calling you towards this morning. If you're, if you're sitting there and you're wrestling with it right now, saying, Lord, I, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. I don't have it. Well, let your eyes settle on this wonderful last phrase at the end of verse 3. Look down there. Look at these words. These two women are among those whose names are in the book of life. See, we may not know what the issue was that divided them, but we know what brought them together. We may not know all the chapters in between, but we know the beginning of their story and we know the end of their story. This very moment, even as we are meeting here in this room, Yodia and Syntyche are alive and well, and they are together eternally in the Lord, never again to be divided, never again to feel the pain of separation. They are now experiencing a unity and a closeness that far exceeds the deepest relationships that we hold dear in this life. That's the end of their story. And why is that the case? Why is that the case? Because their names were recorded in the same book. They were put side by side long before they were ever born and long before anything ever divided them. 
Their names were put there by the sovereign Lord Himself before the foundation of the world. And those whom God has called to unity in eternity past, man cannot and will not ultimately divide in present day. Cannot happen. And blessed are those. Blessed are those who labor and who lose to see that unity come to fruition. Because it's coming. It's not a matter of if, it's when. There's a unity that will never divide again. And one day, church, one day this will be our story. This will be our names. Along the way, we will be one of these ladies. Along the way, we will be a true companion. In the midst of our conflicts, we know We know the one who is in control. And we know how he has healed the greatest divide. And may it be said of us that when our time came, even in the moments when it was the hardest, maybe the moment right now, moments we most wanted to run away, or that we most wanted to fight, in those moments we heard his still small voice gently speaking to us, And lifting our gaze to his glory and to his grace. And on that wonderful day when that book is opened, may there be names. Names that we can point to. Faces in this room right now. People that God put into our lives. Put us in community with. Put us in fellowship with. People who along the way maybe we were on separate sides but people who leaned on us when they needed it and people upon whom we leaned when we needed it. And may we be able to say about each other, we helped each other get home. We helped each other get home. If I haven't said it enough, let me say it one more time. Conflict is inevitable. But God, God, the one who records who recorded our names in eternity past in this book, the book that nothing can be erased from. That God is greater. And in him, we will find our unity. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this real-life example. Lord, we, we, we thank you for these verses and how relevant they are to our lives right now. We thank you that you preserve them to speak to us this morning by the power of your Spirit. And so, Lord, I just pray. Pray right now for any brother or sister here who is in the midst of this, who may be dealing with or struggling with or wrestling with a conflict. Lord, it's not a battle that's worth continuing. The need to seek, seek reconciliation in the Lord. Lord, would you grant them the strength, Lord, the humility, Lord, ultimately the love for you. Show them your love to strengthen them. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Lord, we pray that even in joy, even if it's difficult, there will be joy in obeying you and that they would find strength even this morning. Lord, we pray that you would continue to protect our church from division and from conflict. Lord, help us to be a people who are quick to reconcile because we love you and we love the church and we love your cause. And Lord, may this church glorify your name, Jesus. Not our own. Not our own, but your name. And may your name move forward. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless the simple, small steps of faith and obedience overwhelmingly. Bring fruit from that. Use it mightily to build your kingdom, Lord Jesus, so that you come and you are, Lord, that day we are all unified around your throne. Pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.